here tonight for our midweek Bible study. Uh, after my myself, we've got the little ones and the teachers downstairs, but it's good to have everyone upstairs. Got a couple of announcements that need to be made, and um, got some, I did not have anyone on the sick list, and all of a sudden people started getting added to the sick list, and I'm going to pull up this one. To, let's see. I think every, just about everybody here knows Rob Shelton, you know, Bart. Um, um, Ed and Joy's son that was raised up here at Liberty lives over in Opelika now and I'll just read the way it was announced um, he's asked for prayers he had a mass surgically removed in early April which turned out to be B-cell lymphoma he had a PET scan this morning will be following up with his oncologist on May the 14th and he and his wife and children they, they asked for all of them to be remembered in your prayers and as we get updates on that we will pass that along to you but that's Rob Shelton also just found out that um, Horace Conway former member here I think he lives in Linden Alabama now fell broke his hip he's had the surgery re a replacement surgery on it not feeling real well right now but hopefully um, he's improving and will go to rehab soon and then um, I think um, I got a, a message from Harrison they're staying home um, Ella Rose um, is um, sick, and I guess others don't feel too well either. Anyone else that needs to be mentioned right now? I continue to remember all those on our prayer list. Um, don't forget the sign-up sheet for teachers that's on the um, bulletin board in the foyer. The new quarter will start in June. And the last Sunday of this month, we'll have our monthly singing, um, that May the 26th at the evening service. Um, get ready for that and then also we'll have a fellowship after the services that evening and then we'll have a fish fry June the 1st and so don't, at the Arbors any other announcements that need to be made if not let's join in our singing together the 250 <clears throat> 250 
we'll continue our study of the fruit of the Spirit tonight. We've got three more weeks until the summer series starts. Um, on the Wednesday nights during the summer, June, July, and August, we usually bring in guest speakers to speak. We will have some guest speakers, and, and I'll have um, a listing of those very shortly, but um, we have some of the men within the congregation um, that will be speaking as well. So um, I appreciate those who volunteered or were coerced or however you want to put it, but that will be speaking this, this summer. I know they'll do a good job. We'll have our <clears throat> one, one Wednesday night out of the month, we'll have a devotional, uh, not just singing, but, um, you know, um, either short lessons or um, scripture readings that point toward a certain direction as well. But um, so be praying for the summer series, invite people to come. We'll have some from here, some from elsewhere that will be speaking. So I know we'll have a good summer series. But right now we'll continue with the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> We'll go back very quickly to Galatians chapter 5 and just reread the fruit of the, what it says about the fruit of the Spirit because it talks about contrast really walking according to the flesh and walking according to the Spirit and we're supposed to walk according to the Spirit and it says in Galatians 5 and verse 22 but the fruit now after describing all the evil works works of the flesh but, but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And so, I mean, he, he lists these characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And we've looked at uh, quite a few of these. We've talked about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and we're now talking about faithfulness. We'll have two, um, two more after that, gentleness and self-control. And we'll see how far we get in the next three weeks after tonight. But we're finishing up on our study of, of faithfulness. And um, toward the end of that study or midway through it, we, you, if you have one of the outlines, I, I would give out more, but I think the last. I have one more outline. If some, anyone need an outline. It, it processes slowly sometimes, but no. And we're glad to have you with us tonight. Um, but where the title is, it says, Faithfulness is a Virtue. We have been discussing, you know, it's a virtue because there's just so few faithful people. I mean, I mean, we can sometimes say, poor pitiful me, I'm all alone. And really when we think about it, there are people we know that are faithful children of God, and that's wonderful. Hopefully we're one of those. But when you look at percentage-wise in the world, there's just so few that are faithful. I mean, you know, they may, you know, some, some that never have been, some that were and are not now, and it's just sad to see. I mean, Proverbs 20 and verse 6, most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? And we look back at, um, you know, at Abraham pleading on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, and there weren't very many right, righteous men, not enough to save Sodom and Gomorrah there. And we don't know what that number is for our country or whatever, but you know we see our country going the wrong way, and sometimes you just say, "Well, who can find a faithful man?" Um, it's just, but there are some that are. We don't need to be like the prophet who you know cried, "I'm I, I'm the only one left," and God comes back and says, "No, you're wrong. There's thousands of, that are still faithful, but still percentage-wise, there's not as many faithful." And God will praise a person by calling them faithful. I'm just thinking about. Him praising Job, for instance. Um, Paul mentioned that as well in Colossians 4, 7. He called Tychicus a beloved brother, faithful minister. I mean, here's one that's faithful. Um, and Paul told Timothy, the things I've taught you, you teach to faithful men. You, know, you, you teach it to the others that are faithful. There's blessings that are promised to the faithful. The one that always comes to my mind is the first in Revelation 2, 10. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. He goes on and tells them some things they'll suffer. But he says, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. If we're told to get the crown of life, you're faithful until death. We're not perfect, no, but we are about through the blood of Christ. 
But as far as our faithfulness, we're supposed to be faithful, live a faithful life. That's our manner of life or way of life. If that's a requirement to go to heaven, it means we can be faithful. And, and, but that's something that's praise. That's something that is a virtue. Um, Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man will abound with blessings. You know, I mean, if you want to be truly blessed in this life, be faithful to God. Psalm 31, 23, O oh, love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. You ever had someone tell you, boy, you got what you deserve, you got what you asked for, or maybe you feel that way. You realize that you said the wrong thing to someone, and boy, they got, came back and got you, and you go, well, I deserve that. You may, you may not say it, but you may think it and, and may not like it, but if God fully repays that proud, arrogant person, I mean, we don't want to be on that part. We want to be the one that the Lord preserves. And then we, we that's where we got to last week. Any comments up to that point? And let's go take up a Psalm 101, verse 6. <clears throat> Psalm 101, verse 6. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way he shall serve me. God's eyes are on the faithful of the land. I mean, what does it mean, though? He who walks in a perfect way. How do we walk in a perfect way? The perfect way we walk is walking in God's word. It's the lamp to our feet, a light to our pathway. That's the, the way. Other thoughts? Um, you think about Jesus, I am the way, Jesus said. That's the perfect way. It, again, it, we, we've discussed this before about faithfulness and when we first started looking at it. It doesn't mean that we never make a mistake. It doesn't mean that we <clears throat> never sin. But the idea is the pathway that we're on is the right pathway. We're on the pathway of Christ, the pathway of following God's word, walking in the light, as it, as it says in 1 John. You walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins. That's the way that we walk. And perfection can have the idea of maturity as well. I mean, we're supposed to grow and mature as a Christian, but just keep on keeping on. What do we do when we sin? Ask for forgiveness, okay? What do some people do when they sin? Sin more, okay? They, they either are ashamed of it and just go hide in the corner somewhere or just, I can't. You ever done something you're just embarrassed about? I mean, it may not be anything sinful, but you ever been embarrassed? You say, I just can't show my face anymore. And, um, any, but on the other hand, a person sins, and they may just feel like, boy, I really messed up big. I don't know how I can ever face everyone again. And what they may, don't realize is if they do face everyone, I mean, they may be surprised at how people receive them. But what really matters is if you face God with it and, like you say, repent, you know, ask God's forgiveness, It'll be taken care of. But the point is, don't let it keep you away by just continuing in sin, maybe hoping grace will abound or not caring. Don't let it be something you're so ashamed of that you don't want to face anyone. You, you look at the difference, Judas, you know, look at what he did. He was sorry for what he did, but he went out and hung himself. Versus Peter, who was sorry for what he did and came back to the Lord. That's what we need to do. But I mean... That, the idea of perfection, we're not sinlessly perfect in and of ourselves. We, will, we strive to perfection. Any other thoughts? Matthew 25, 21. The Lord, his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. How are you a good and faithful servant? How do you become a good and faithful servant as a child of God? If you're a Christian, how, how do you become a good and faithful servant? Use your abilities. Use your talents. That's another way of putting it. Um, you know, you look at Matthew 25. I mean, you have the, it's the parable of the talents where it says, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, the, he went off and came back and they gave a, a reckoning of what they had. The five had doubled theirs, the, the other had doubled his, the one talent man had hit it in the ground and dug it back up. And 
he, he was not praised. The other two were praised as good and faithful servants. And he says to, and so, um, but then it comes in to God, the Jesus judging the nations when the Son of Man comes in his glory and will all stand before him. All the nations will be gathered before him. He'll separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He'll set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. And talking about being faithful, the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, if the Lord said that to you, what would you say? Thank you. <laughs> and come on in. You know, if he says, come on in, I, I'm running. I, that always get. but well, what do they say? And I, I mean, of course, the Lord. No, that, they were just kind of surprised. They said, Lord, when did we see you a stranger? You know, when, when, when have we ever seen you in this situation? And, and when did we see you a stranger and take you in? When did we see you naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Jesus, I meant thank you, but when do we ever do that to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So what's that tell us? What's a part, what's a part of faithfulness? Taking care of the needy, helping others, reaching out to them. If someone needs a cup of water, you know, th you know we, we don't want to get in... We don't want to get involved, don't want to worry with it. I watch some of the, you get to watch some of these little videos online and people will pretend to be down and out, you know, or need some help. Somebody just needs some help. Like it'd be a blind person that fell and it turns out they're not really blind. They didn't really fall, but they're trying to see who will stop and help. And if someone does stop and help, they'll, say, they'll give them like a new computer, a thousand dollars or whatever for stopping and helping. And you think, boy, that's great. But... There's something more important than a computer or a thousand dollars, isn't it? It's a person that needs help. It's a person. It's also doing it like you're doing it to the Lord, and there's a matter of eternal reward. But I mean, it's not just with physical needs. There are people that are hungry, thirsty, naked spiritually. They're in prison to sin, and we need to reach out and help them. But Jesus said, if you have a hard time doing it to your fellow man, just because they're your fellow man. Um, do it like you're, you're looking at it like you're doing it to me. Here's the other side of that. He'll say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. My Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Boy, if you saw Jesus that way, you'd do those things, wouldn't you? And that's what they say. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Jesus, if we'd seen you, we would have done it. But Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the, the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I mean, this idea of faithfulness and uh, of doing good to others, um, being a good and faithful servant. There are big ways we can do it. There's little ways we can do it. <clears throat> but the little things make a difference. It can make a difference in someone else's life, but in ours as well. And you'll find that if you began to do the little things, it'll help the big things come a little bit more naturally as well. But um, you know, the, the, with the talents, the ones that, that, that used it and did right, they, that more would be given to them. But the ones who don't use it, even that which they have will be taken away. Any other thoughts? I mean, these are things we know, but it's easy to go, oh, this just doesn't really matter. You know, this is just one time or whatever, one situation. And, and you make the bad run, say, give them the end of things, take them away. It's a spiritual force. Yeah, it doesn't mean if you don't give a if you don't give something to drink to a person who's thirsty, you won't have something to drink tomorrow. I mean, that's not necessarily what he's saying. But and you're not gonna get rich because you did good. No, no, we there's the health and wealth gospels, gospel, we call it many times, where people will promise that if you just follow Jesus and really have faith in him, you won't get sick, you won't have problems. Oh, boy, everything will just be a bed of roses and wealth will come in. Did God promise that? 
He didn't, did he? I mean, in fact, he told us if you, if you live righteous, you're going to suffer persecution. And he, he didn't say you won't be rich, but he didn't promise you would be rich. But whether you're rich or poor or somewhere in between, follow him. Yeah, like you say, the, the blessings that are there, that which is given, it's spiritual in nature. And that's the most important. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult road, it's a difficult road to travel. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, he's not the only one. I mean, there's a, yeah, and I'm just saying he's a good, I mean, I mean there's a lot of them that way. That, and, I, and, and there's people that believe, and I've, I have had people that become a Christian, and after a few weeks and a few, or a few months, they'll say, you know, I thought all my problems would go away. I, I just thought it'd all be good. And really, spiritually, it's good. I mean, you, you've had your sins forgiven. You're a child of God. You have the peace that passes understanding, the hope that you're supposed to have. All spiritual blessings, they're there. You have a new spiritual family. But they were hoping they wouldn't have any bills to pay anymore or uh, that, you know, they wouldn't, you know, boy, they're struggling at work and they'd get that dream job or whatever. Everything's supposed to, you know, all their family issues, um, they, you know, the, the, they're at odds with some sibling or some other family member, and uh, oh, it's supposed to all be good now. Well, no. I mean, you're looking at it from a different perspective now, but there's still, in the world, you'll have tribulation. But through Christ, we overcome the world. But people look at it from the wrong perspective. They're looking for the bless riches here rather than riches there. Other thoughts? Okay, it makes you able to deal with those things better. That's a better, that's a good way of putting it, better than what I was trying to say. Yeah, I mean, we can handle situations much better with the proper Christian attitude and with the Lord's help. I've mentioned before, I've, I've talked to people who are struggling with sin in their life, and they're not a Christian, and, and they know they need to become one, and they'll say, look, i got to get all these things straightened out of my life before I can become a Christian. Once I get this straightened out, I'll become a Christian. And, and I said, are you really trying to straighten out? They go, yeah. And I said, are you really sorry for the things that you've done in your life? Absolutely. Do you want to be better and not do it again? Yes. Do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Sure. Do you know what he says to do to be saved? Yes, I need to be baptized for the remission of sins. And I said, wouldn't you rather go on and do that, have all your past sins forgiven, and then you deal with that change of life with the help of the Lord? I mean, you know, you'll have his help as a child of God. I mean, he's promised to help us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You know, don't put off and try to do it all. You can't fix it all yourself. You have to have Christ. And go ahead and become a Christian and work. the Lord will work with you, through you, and on you, and, and help you be what you should be. But, And even his wife said, curse God and die. I mean, and, and she probably thought she was trying to, hit, look, Job, you are, with all this misery, I mean, look at all we have lost. You just, you're going to keep on suffering. You know, the devil's got a hold of you. Just curse God and die. Get out of your misery. But he didn't do it, did he? Now, he asked some questions along the way. He didn't fully understand everything either, did he? I mean, he didn't. But at the same time, he remained faithful. You know, it's okay to ask questions if we look to the scripture for answers and pray for wisdom and understanding. That's fine. But don't lose, don't just push your faith aside and say, I'm not going to have faith until I get all the answers. I mean, we're going to be asking questions till the day we die on some things. But um, we, we can know what we need to know. I mean, the Bible gives us everything. We know, I go back to Deuteronomy 29 29, the secret things belong to God. You know, I mean, there's some things we may not know this side of eternity. But Job didn't curse God and die. He didn't blame God. Uh, he, he sought answers. And God was with him and, and then in the end blessed him far more than in the beginning. He still lost some loved ones. I mean, even though he had more children, he still lost some along the way. And, and I'm, that, I'm sure that left a hole in his heart there for them. 
but he didn't curse God. He didn't die. He, he trusted in the Lord through it. That's true. No matter how bad things are, we still got to have faith. No matter how good things are, we need to still have faith. I mean, and I talk about that before. That can be a temptation to people as well. You talking about the Billy was talking about the, the wealth and money and some things. That can be that can pull people away from God just as much as the bad. So, but whatever the case may be, we're supposed to be faithful. Well, we're supposed to hear. We want to hear, "Well done, good and faithful servant." Not that we, you know, salvation is through the grace of God, the blood of Christ. But that doesn't excuse being unfaithful. There's still things he demands of us to do as simple servants of God. And he, he wants us to be faithful to him. And um, we need to just not be kind of an okay servant. You know, some people go through, work, go through jobs and do their work, just kind of just enough to get by. And um, be a good and faithful servant. And then um, faithfulness is a virtue because such are like God. To be faithful is to be like God. Now that doesn't mean we're on the level with God, but it's God-like characteristics. Lamentations 3.23 They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Talking about God. God is perfectly faithful in his promises, in his character, in his love, whatever you want to say. God is faithful. And um, if we, if we strive toward faithfulness, we're, distri- we're striving to be more God-like, more Christ-like. Any thoughts on that? We're, we're supposed to become Christ-like. Yeah, I think it was Amos 6 where he warned the ones that are at ease in Zion. That, you know, Israel got, boy, eat, drink, and be merry was their attitude at that point. They had the best of everything. And he said, look, you know, you've forgotten God. You've forgotten to be sorry, sorrowful for your sins and your unrighteousness. That's a temptation. On the other hand, like you say, when bad things happen, God, why are you doing this to me? Or it may not be, why, God, why are you doing it? God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? And yet God hasn't promised that, you know, um, everything's going to be perfect. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I'll fear no evil. I mean, you know, there, there's going to be, in the, you know, in the presence of my enemy, you know, prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. There's going to be difficulties here. There's going to be enemies. <clears throat> we can go through the valleys in life and ultimately that final valley of death. But um, the Lord has promised to be with us and see us through it. Not all of life's going to be on the mountaintop. There's valleys there as well. Um, but to be God-like, to be faithful. Psalm 119, 138. Every verse of Psalm 119 talks about God's commandment, God's word, God's law. This one says, your testimonies which you have commanded. Talking about God. Your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. How do many people today, even those that profess to be Christians, how do many people look at Scripture, at the Bible? What's the attitude of a lot of folks? You ever had a study? What's that? (coughs) Okay, it's just a fairy tale. tale. Okay, and I mean... You can look at different, I mean, and it, you find people, I was talking to um, someone today, um, you know, at the country colleges, he, he just said, I can't, I was talking, uh, 
I was talking to a fellow Christian. Said, he said, it really doesn't matter what you believe. You know, you can believe whatever you want to believe or do whatever you want to do, and it doesn't matter. And he, he kind of discounted what the Word of God said. And, and that, you know, it just shocked the fellow. I go, well, that's nothing new. I mean, that's everywhere. But you will hear a lot of folks that will think the Bible is a, something good to read. Some, some people think it's made up. Even some people think it came from God. They'll acknowledge it came from God doesn't believe it's our final authority. They don't look at all scriptures given by the inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It thoroughly furnishes us every good work. In fact, on um, some, some con religious conference here lately, I was, there's arguing over, some, some group was arguing over um, about things like allowing ministers to be um, in, you know, in a same-sex marriage or whatever, and, some were opposing it and said, look, you know, don't discount what the Word of God says. It says, look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which said what I just said. And, and so I'm saying, look, we've got to go back to the Word of God. And, and that's true for all of us because all of God's testimonies, everything he's commanded us, it's righteous. It's very faithful. It's the right thing. I mean, we can look at doctrinal issues and see where this religious group or that religious group is caught up in things that, are contrary to scripture we can um, but then we can look at our lives individually and, and say wait a minute now I, I, I excuse this verse in my life or I condone this other verse in my life you know we don't always practice what we preach I mean sometimes it's easy to excuse ourselves when Paul said I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content we think well Paul you had not been through what I've, I've been through and you know and yet you look at what he went through or, Lord, I know you told me to, to go the second mile, to turn to the other cheek, but you don't know this person I'm dealing with. I, I can't do You know, we excuse it in our life. But he said, no, I mean, if we're going to be faithful, everything that God said is righteous. It's the right thing. It's faithful. When God tells us whatever he tells us in the scripture, don't put a but there. Or I know what he says here, but, you know, when God tells us thou shalt or thou shalt not, we, we better or we better not, you know, on that. It, it's, God gave us the, if the, if the word doesn't matter, why did he give it to us? You know, Jesus said the words that he's taught us, are, that's what's supposed to judge us on the last day. And so God is faithful. And, and when the Jesus said that, he meant it. Uh, they're right, it's righteous, it's very faithful. And we want to be like God. We want to be Christ-like. And faithfulness is one of those. And in contrast, really, and we looked at this just a moment ago. I got ahead of myself. The contrast in Matthew 25 between the faithful and the unfaithful. Um, you know, it says, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servants. You are faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter to the joy of the Lord. I mean, it says he was given a job to do. He did it well. He was dependable. He did what was expected to him. If you're a servant, and you look at, you know, not just a person that is a hired servant, but you look back in that day and age when you had the slavery or whatever, and you were a servant to someone, maybe an indentured servant that owed money and trying to pay it off or whatever, when the one who was over you told you something to do, what were you supposed to do? Do the best you could. Do what he said to do to the best of your ability. You know, the book of Philemon was written by Paul to Philemon, about a runaway slave by the name of Onesimus. He said, look, I'm sending him back to you. But I, I, we, he's changed. He's a Christian now. He's going to be a better person. He's going to be a better servant. You know, he may, you know if, if he owes anything, I'll take care of it. But bring, take him back as a brother in Christ now. I mean, but the idea is a servant's there to serve their master's desires and their master's needs. Well, we're... You know, we're not in slavery to sin anymore, but we are. Romans 6 says we're a servant of righteousness. We're a servant of Christ. And when Christ tells us to do something, we're supposed to do it. I mean, you know, I'm, I mean, and the thing, the thing is, does he tell us to do anything bad or harmful? No. Anything that's not good for us? No. In fact, if you live the Christian life, yeah, there'll be opposition out there. But it's really the best life, isn't it? I think it's a much happier life when you look at, the things Jesus said, not to hold hatred and bitterness in your heart, to do good to other people. 
to, to be the best person that you can be and, and to, to humble yourself, have humility as well. Uh, but um, you look at the faithful doing the job they're doing, doing what, they're, what is expected of them. Now, we don't have the attitude of the Pharisee and the, the prayers of the Pharisee and um, the publican and the Pharisee that, God, I think you, you know, I'm not like this man or that. I mean, not, not an arrogant attitude. It's a humble attitude. But in the unfaithful, it goes back to Luke 16. And we can see the unfaithful as well in Matthew 25. But in Luke 16, verse 1 and 2, he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. You know, a steward is over something that belongs to someone else, and we're stewards. You know, everything that we have talent-wise, every possession we have really belongs to God. We're just stewards left in charge for a while. But here he's talking to, a stu to his steward. He said, you can't be steward any longer. He who it, and so, I mean, he said, look, you, you have not done what you're supposed to do as a steward. You have not been accountable, and you haven't done what's right. So you're not a steward anymore. It's taken away from you. On the other hand, you get down to verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. And you find that many times. You know, you might say, well, it's a little thing. But if you're, if you're not really faithful in little things, are you going to be faithful in big things, you know, as well? Um, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you've been faithful in what is another's, who will give you what is your own? I mean, say, look, be faithful. You know, be faithful whether it's in our worldly secular jobs, in our worldly li the life that we live in the world. Be faithful as a Christian, uh, as accountable to God as well. Here was a wasteful steward that didn't do his job well. He may have been depend, you know, if he's not dependent on those little things he's supposed to do, he won't be in, in, in many. And it says, faithful men and women can give a good accounting. Um, remember Daniel in Daniel 6 and verse 4. Uh, they, those governors became jealous of Daniel because, you know, they didn't like you know, him as a Jew. They didn't like that he was one of the king's favorites. <clears throat> and they, they said, we're going we're gonna to take him down. You know, you look at politics and you look at the fighting there and, uh, you know, you look at how people are doing their best to try to destroy Donald Trump, and you can like him or hate him, whatever else, but you, you, you see the, the obsession with trying to take a person down. But with Daniel, they wanted, to take this, they wanted to take Daniel down, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error, error or fault that could be found in him. He wasn't perfect. But they couldn't find something. They said, boy, we'll find something. We'll dig up some dirt. Anybody in power, you can dig up some dirt on them somewhere. How did they finally accuse him? How did they find something to accuse him of? Was it because he was unfaithful? They trapped him in his... Yeah, they, yeah they, the evil government tried to kill him for worshiping God. But you said he's a faithful man. Yeah. And caught him praying like he always did. You know, they made a rule where you couldn't pray or ask any petition except for the king and, you know, all of that. And he always prayed in his window face, facing toward Jerusalem. That was what he always did. He didn't just do it to make a point. He did it because that's his manner of life. And he was faithful in that they knew he would be. And that's where he got thrown in the lion's den. Of course, God saved him out of that lion's den. But the point is the only way they could get him was to try to trap him in his own goodness, I guess you'd say. Uh, hopefully, if people look to try to find fault in us for whatever reason, you know, we're not going to be perfect, but hopefully they can't find anything that they can just say, boy, look how terrible that person is. Look, look, you know, maybe how big of a hypocrite, how big of a sinner or whatever. Hopefully, people don't see that in our life. Hopefully, they see that which is good. And it says, it seems to be obvious that God judges more by man's character then by the number of talents, abilities, opportunities that he has. I mean, you may say, well, I, you know, I don't have as many talents as so-and-so. You might surprise yourself. I don't have as many opportunities as this other person does. Well, use the opportunities that you have, the abilities that you have, the talents that you have in service to God. And that's all God requires of us. Any other thoughts? We, do what? 
Everybody thinks they can will and deal with God, but <laughs> that doesn't, that's right. You can't make your own deal with God. God deals with us according to what the scriptures say, and he, he's laid that out there. That's it for this evening, then. I mean, if you, when we're finished with the class. We'll take up the value of faithfulness next week, and the classes should be coming in in just a second. That what now? The last part? Character yeah, character alone doesn't carry you. You have to put it in action. You know, you may sit back and say, well, you know, I have never done anything wrong. I haven't used any bad words. I haven't lied, cheated, or stolen, or whatever. But what have you done? Have you used, like I say, have you put it in action, used your opportunities and your talents? Good point. I appreciate the discussion tonight. Verse 65, Behold a stranger at the door. I forgot to mention Brother Sidney's at home tonight. He's taking a shot for back pain, and he can't get around right now. So um, he, he'd love for you to remember him in prayer as well as he struggles with that and the loss of Sister Nancy as well. We, in the auditorium class, talking about faithfulness and just about to get to the end of that part of the fruit of the Spirit, but we looked at the judgment scene in Matthew chapter 25. And Jesus looking at us on the right and said, you know, I was hungry, I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you clothed me. I was um, in prison and you visited me. And, and they said, when, when did we do that, Lord? And, and he said, when you did it to the least one of these, you did it to me. But then he turned to the ones on the left hand and said, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And they want to know, when did we do that? And he said, when you didn't do it to at least one of these, you didn't do it to me. And then he says, surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal. Forever. And sometimes we make mistakes and you say, boy, it's going to take a long time to correct this mistake. Um, some mistakes are easier to correct than others. But if we reach eternity and we're not prepared, it's not a matter of going back and correcting it and making it right. It's eternity, heaven or hell. But we can make our lives right now. If you are a Christian struggling with things, I mean, pray about it. Um, let the Lord lift you up and help you. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you sins. If you need to make a public confession, or, or need prayers on your behalf, we're glad to help with that as well. If you're not a Christian, why not come to Christ tonight? We're singing, Behold a Stranger at the Door. I mean, Jesus is knocking at the door. He wants to be a part of your life. If you'll come to him in simple, obedient faith in him as the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, will you not arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord? If you need to respond to the invitation, the Lord's invitation anyway, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? <laughs>
come together to worship you, study your word, encourage one another. I ask you to help us to take the lesson.